Now, before we start, I, I know with this, the result what you see to, saw today, or seeing today, is months of hard work. Clearly, the symposium started, we made an announcement by January, but last few months, few weeks, but Beth and her team working tirelessly to bring all of you here, that definitely she needs a big hand of applause. <laughs> Superb. Now we learned a little better because we didn't expect, of course, welcome everyone, but next year we'll be better prepared. So there will not be this, uh, today is just half hour late, but everything will be same, but half hour. But we definitely, I guarantee you, we, uh, from this, we learn a lot and we will be uh, better off next year. So uh, as Beth said that uh, our goal always has been both physician as well as nurses and technologist uh, education. Uh, so the symposium we started in 1998, uh, 27th minus one, uh, and always has been the nurse, tech, techni nurse technology symposium uh, day, either day before or day after. Uh, many times had been, we had done all kind of experiment. So today, this happened, a little unusual. Uh, our main, uh, the coronary cases symposium will be tomorrow at Marriott, and uh, we did here. Next year, we'll figure out which way to do. But goal is the entire day of teaching, 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 and uh, share our knowledge, particularly what we have been doing here to get to, not only to the volume, volume-wise we are number one since 2005, but also safety. Do it correctly, and that is the goal. So we know, let's start with the top 10. It may be a little too much uh, for some of you, uh, but I'll try to show uh, some data. But in the end, do not worry. In the last slide, I'll put everything together, one slide. Uh, so, so we'll go home with the clear-cut points. So our field of interventional cardiology started by Andreas Grundtvig, who did the balloon that time in 1977. And you see that uh, case which they have after uh, so many years uh, remained open. That was balloon angioplasty. Then, of course, we did uh, many other techniques like rotablation, then stents, and drug coated stents, and so So his dream was the catheter based percutaneous treatment of vascular disease and alert and awake patient. He was the do one, teach one, I mean, see one, and uh, teach one. So basically, you see first, go, go to the workshops, then you learn from there. Then you do yourself, and then you start teaching. So this whole, our interventional cardiology, doing the live cases, is started by Andreas Grundtvig. And I added into there that utmost safety and appropriate. So what we do is we need to be responsible that we are doing the right thing to the patient. Not that there is a blockage, we take care of it. Anybody can put a stent, but is the patient needs the stent. And in a complex case, people don't want to do it, but patient needs it, then you can do it also. So that's where our name comes in. About one third of our cases are sent by other interventionists to be done here, not from the system, from outside, because they want that to be done uh, safely. And of course, many of these patients are outpatient. So this will be our goal for last 23, uh, 24, starting with the mechanical circulatory support in cardiovascular shock, euro shock, ECLS shock, and danger shock. You saw these are our mechanical circulatory support systems, balloon pump. PTVA, which is the transeptal puncture, then Impala, which is 2.5 and CP, and then we have the ECMO. ECMO is, you know, big machine. Everybody has this mind um, that, no, we are portable. We actually take the machine to emergency room of some other hospital and put uh, Greg Sarawa from our team, and the, with this, we are there ready. If somebody needs uh, in Brooklyn, in Westchester, in Long Island, uh, need a uh, ECMO, they can go and, and cannulate the patient in the emergency room or in the unit and bring them here. So this is, these are the four devices, and they have been looked into it. The first one is the Euroshock trial, 15th center in Europe, and basically was whether in cardiogenic shock, Using ECMO is better than your standard therapy. And what they found basically a 30-day follow-up, a small trial of 35 patients, that at 30 day and one year outcome were identical, no difference, individual points are here, and no significant difference, rather higher bleeding and vascular complication with ECMO. So got negative marks, no good. So okay, let's do another trial. We keep doing it, maybe till we do it right. And now this is the second trial, which is the ECLS shock, uh, two countries in Germany and Slovenia, uh, in again, you know, uh, large number of patients in this trial, basically about uh, 400 plus. Again, again, looking at the same concept, does ECMO in cardiogenic shock helps? 
We are talking about only cardio and shock, not for others like COVID and other, those, they're helpful. But we are talking about cardio and shock. And again, 30-day endpoint, you can see the curves exactly identical, no difference in mortality, and rather higher vascular complication. So conclusion, ECMO did not work in cardio and shock. So we'll say we try some other device then. What about using Impala? Then there is a trial called Danger Shock. It started from Denmark, then went to Germany and UK, and this is on about 400 patient trial. Standard care, again cardiogenic shock, versus microaxial flow pump, that's Impala, 40. And you see here, uh, curves basically, standard of care versus uh, um, the use of Impala. Significant reduction in mortality, points here, 58.5 versus 45.8. 13% reduction in mortality using Impala, which the p-value is significant. Yes, there is still higher bleeding, but overall significant reduction in mortality, and that led to the positive outcome of a trial of cardiogenic shock using Impala. Second is the, we call it CHIP. I'm sure you have heard about complex high-risk interventional cases. What does that mean? And what is the outcome of those patients? There is a, and we show, there was a score, recent score came from the UK, uh, their society, BCIS, and we translated into our database. So they basically was that you define the complex case based on the patient factors, which are seven on the right side, and procedural factor, there are six. And then based on the how many factors patient has, you can have an in-hospital MACI, major adverse cardiovascular cerebral event. And you can see can go from 20% to 1%. So low, uh, no risk, low risk, intermediate, and high risk. So this was a 30 day done by the UK. We said, well, why don't we put this into our database of Mount Sinai and look into that, what happened at one year? So we took the same seven and six factors and about 21,000 of our patients, we divided them based on their score, zero, one to two, three to four and five. And looks like at one year, we duplicated their results. Same, 1.7, 3, 6 and 12, multiple. So it tells you that, yes, identifying patient more complex uh, is, will strategize your patient, so your throughput, who should be admitted, who should be watched, who should be followed more closely, that high-risk patient need to have more close follow-up. Uh, and uh, so this is great uh, advancement and great uh, paper in the literature. Then the drug-coated balloon. Drug-coated balloon has come to America now. This is the, basically what is drug-coated balloon, and this is actually a nice video. Uh, we or put a drug eluting stent or drug coated stent, uh, which we have been using. Um, but now, many times, the stent itself can give rise to more issues like thrombosis or if patient already have a stent, now you're re-blocking, what do you do? So this is the whole technique, uh, the science growing in the last five, six years called drug coated balloon or drug eluting balloon. So that same drug, antiproliferative drug, paclitaxel or serolumus put on the balloon. And then with a special way it is tied to it with the nanotechnology, when you inflate the balloon, the drug goes into the vessel wall and it stays there. So that is the whole com concept, see the drug diffusion. And uh, this took a lot of years to get to this, uh, 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 this science that drug coated balloon can deliver the drug at the local site, both in ISR and the de novo. And all the drugs are, say, well, why it is better? Because you're not putting any stent, you don't need the depth. There is no metal, no inflammation, no side branch closure. So therefore, it looks like it may work. Does it work? Knowing that it has been used outside America for so many years, and now we actually have data. In last two years, I also this was one of my top 10. Now I'm going to give you the latest data. This is from China. Uh, patients with the multivessel disease, uh, they randomized patients to drug-coated balloon or drug eluting stents. And basically show, the, you can see the height of the red bar is the drug eluting stent, the blue is the drug coated, significantly lower event rate from 13% to 4%, usually for a smaller vessel. There is a trial called Picolito, a small vessel, three year outcome, again, having a lower event rate uh, with the drug coated balloon in the red. Then the major trial which was led to approval of the device in America is agent trial, but that is drug coated balloon for ISR. Uh, and uh, this is the paclitaxel from Boston Scientific, uh, and you can see the outcome, the TLR rate and TVMI rate, significantly lower with the agent drug-coated balloon compared to balloon angioplasty, and no stent thrombosis, because there's no stent. And uh, the height of the 
green bar significantly lower than the red. So it seems to be drug-coated balloon is available now. It only pro problem is right now the cost is $5,000. And there's no reimbursement. So tough. So the, we, and that happens in America. We get the technology approved by FDA, and till they get an insurance approval, it lags behind. And there, therefore, the technology may be very good, but it's lag, it's use based on the reimbursement. Because otherwise, you start using it, your hospital will become bankrupt. Just to give you a comparative, regular balloon is $150. The stands are $500, and this drug-coated balloon is $5,000. So we use it. It's, uh, we were actually one of the earlier adopter of it. Uh, that was the news uh, we are using in selected cases. But at the same time, we are part of the randomized trial, which is the serolumus, another one called solution. And we had done a lot of cases of that drug-coated balloon. So what is happening now, the things are coming full circle. Anders Grunzig started with a balloon. Then we went to stand, drug eluding stand. Now we are coming back. Maybe just the drug-coated balloon is good enough. So key is the lesion preparation. If it looks good, you can leave it without putting a stent, particularly two situations. One is small vessels, 2.25 to 2.75, where DES is still a high restenosis. And second is when there is a restenosis of the stent. So ISR are the two ways where it is useful. Then the last two, three years have been full of many, many randomized trials, adding imaging or evaluating imaging in addition to angiography, intracoronary imaging, in addition to angiography, does it improve outcome? And there are many of the trials which we'll go through one by one. And as you can see, we have a angiogram. On the right side is the OCT, then the IVAS. On the left side is the NEARS, which is infrared spectroscopy. Look at the yellow plaque. Uh, and then FFR and IFR, all these have been evaluated in various trials that does do adding these Additional imaging devices improve our outcome beyond just we do for an angiogram. So let me go through one by one. Renovate complex PCI was the first one uh, to a large number of patients, 2,000 plus cases. Imaging guided versus angiography guided, 75% was the IVAS, 25% OCT. Height of the blue bar, almost half uh, event rate compared to angio-guided PCI. You can see stent thrombosis 0.7 to 0.1 and uh, targeted vessel failure from 12 to 7. Very important, very positive trial. The second trial was the Illumin 4, the patient with a complex PCI, OCT, versus angiography guided. And you can see what it did is that OCT group had a better lumen at end of the procedure, 5.72 versus 5.36 on angio, but outcome at 18 months was not different. As you can see, the lower, no significant difference, except your stent thrombosis was half, 1.4 to 0.5, one third actually. So to say, partially positive trial, better lumen and lower stent thrombosis, but major endpoints were not different. Then the third trial was done in Europe of the called the October trial of the bifurcation using the OCT, and again large number of patients uh, uh, follow up up to two years and 1,200 patients, and showing that OCT guided event rate was 10, and it was 14% uh, in other way, uh, angiography guided, and lower stent thrombosis as shown here. So it seems to be that imaging trials were all kind of positive, except Illumin was positive and uh, neutral. So then uh, Greg Stone from here, who is the academic chief, uh, academic director of uh, Mount Sinai Fuster Heart, uh, is put this together. All the trials uh, which are sh there, it actually just came out in Lancet. And just to see imaging, what it does, intravascular imaging, whether OCT or IVAS, and the right side, there is a significant reduction in all the outcomes, anywhere from 50% to 30%. So even mortality, uh, stent thrombosis decrease in half. So overall, it seems to be that imaging definitely helps to improve our outcomes. So what we do uh, in United States, this number is about 28%. Actually, 22% was the earlier, but now we got the latest data a few weeks ago. It's 28% of the PCI in America are being done using intracoronary imaging, which is 75% IVAS and 25% OCT. And their importance comes that you need to get a good result of your intervention. Another important imaging was my associate, Dr. Keeney, who will be presenting her you know, later, the late-breaking clinical trial. Very important, that single center, making a late-breaking trial, was, we are proud of it. Yellow 3, basically was Evolucomab is your Repatha, giving it to twice a month uh, to overall, and that 26 weeks, that 
key says that we, give, we say, well, patient on statins do better. But why? It's only LDL reduction or they change the plaque composition. And plaque, we know which rupture with a thin cap or those who have high lipid. If you decrease that, it became the mechanistic that, yes, that is how the lipid, anti-lipid therapy works. And here, look at this one. The minimal cap, fibrous cap thickness decreased from seven, uh, increased from 70.9 to 97.7. What does that mean? The thin cap became thick. So 48% was at start, became only 13% remained thin. So very important. Second is that the, the yellow plaque, uh, which decreased significantly from 306 to 213. So yes, the statin do work by making the cap thick and decreasing the uh, plaque. And this actually shown in this uh, slide. And this uh, will be presenting some uh, more data from the same in the European Society of Cardiology. Then comparison, you say, well, now it both looks good. IVAS and OCT, so which one is better? We actually have a trial called Octivus, OCT IVAS. Uh, and real name, 2000 patient trial, uh, overall, the, we know that OCT require contrast, so the little higher contrast use. Otherwise, no difference, uh, except that little more time. But outcome at 12 months, identical, no difference. So you decide OCT versus IVAS. Anything, both are good. A lot of people use IVAS because of simplicity and not able to give uh, or not need to give uh, contrast, which will require in uh, OCT. Then the functional versus cul uh, complete versus culprit PCI in old. So remember, the trials have shown that once you have MI, your multivessel disease, you should open all the vessels. Complete revascularization compared to culprit, which we have done so many trials now. Uh, culprit trial and so So all have shown. Now, what about older patient? We say, well, older, maybe you just do a culprit vessel. No. This is the trial looked into it from Italy uh, called FIRE trial. Answer was that patients who are 75 years and above who had multivessel disease, MI, non qm and QMAO, the physiological guided PCI, but complete revascularization versus culprit. And you can see significant reduction in complete revascularization. So 15.7 uh, and overall individual endpoints are shown here. So clearly that complete revascularization, even in old patient, is required to have a better outcome and that has become our practice. Then. Another point was, when you have multi-vessel disease, we have multi multiple vessels, multi-lesions, should you do at the same time? Or you stage it, right? Our practice always has been, do one vessel, stage it, bring patient back in four to six weeks. And this actually was such an important question, uh, was evaluated by two trials. The first one was BioVesc, which, which was done in Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, and Spain. And idea was immediate versus stage complete revascularization. Means complete, yes. But you do it immediate or you do stage. And what the answer was, uh, about, uh, in about uh, 1,400 patients, uh, half of them were non-STEMI, about 40% were STEMI. And clearly you see the height of the uh, blue bar versus red, significantly lower event rate in the immediate complete revascularization versus stage. So what we have been doing, teaching people, do yes, you need to complete revascularization, but do one vessel now, wait four to six weeks, bring the patient back. Guess what they noted? While patient waiting this four to six weeks, they come back with MI or unplanned revascularization. So we learned that you need to do it at the same time. We say, well, we don't change our practice by doing one. Now you say, well, maybe by giving this, there are more bleeding, more kidney failure, nothing happened in those patients. But then we need to have more than one trial to come change our policy. So then there is another trial from Zurich and Switzerland called Multistar AMI, same. Timing of complete revascularization with patients with multivessel disease in P uh, PCI in MI. Immediate PCI during index procedure versus you do it 19 to 45 days. Average was 37 days later. And what did they find? Same what we saw earlier. 16.3 versus 8.5. Half event reduction, same region, unplanned revascularization while you're waiting for patient to come back. So clearly, multivessel disease, MI patient, do it same time, same hospital admission, do not stage. Now, then we know that our physiological trials of the IFR and FFR, uh, which has become part of our routine. Uh, most of patients we do, unless it's a subtotal vessel or MI vessel, we do a FFR, IFR guided, FFR of less than 0.8, IFR of less than 0.89, get the PCI, more than that gets medical therapy. 
and those have been looked into in various aspects. And uh, there are trials uh, of cabbage versus multi-vessel PCI, uh, and uh, fame trial was FFR guided PCI. And you know what FFR and IFR are? Basically, we check the gradient by giving adenosine in the FFR across the blockage, and then uh, IFR or RFR are the diastolic uh, the parameters without giving any vasodilator. And uh, they have been looked into uh, on various aspects, which I'll discuss shortly. But FFR-guided PCI was the FAME-3 trial, which uh, cabbage was superior to FFR. It said, well, maybe let's happen. What happens at three years? Three years still remain uh, beneficial that cabbage was superior to FFR-guided PCI. So team seems to be, in this case, uh, trial, the patients were simple, low syntax score did better with the PCI, but others did better with the cabbage. So multivessel disease, cabbage is still reams over FFR guided PCI as shown here. Now, the, which is better, FFR or IFR? We actually had two trials about five years ago called Defined Flare and uh, IFR Sweetheart. The two trials were done and they basically one year follow were identical. But I want to emphasize and this actually I made uh, about four, five years ago, if it goes to top 10 advances, and I predicted that time, that you see the IFR and FFR guided revascularization strategy, about 6% less revascularization were done in the IFR group. Means 0.89. So you take 100 patients, by doing the FFR, you did PCI on 54%, you did IFR, you did PCI on 47% uh, with the IFR strategy. So there was 6% lower revascularization. At one year outcome, was identical, was no difference. But now you do go to five year. Look at there, there is a decreased mortality in the FFR group compared to IFR, 3% lower. You say, how can that be? I think it was part of the complete revascularization done by FFR. Is the hypothesis generation generated? A lot of people will question that, but this is the finding. And I, as I said, we don't make a decision by one trial. There were two at that time. Remember, sweetheart and uh, defined flare, uh, defined flare outcomes are shown here. And then uh, sweetheart also, there is a 2 plus percent lower mortality. So there is something to it. In this trial also, 6 percent lower revascularization in the IFR group. So is it the complete or better revascularization in the FFR group translated into the lower mortality need to be seen. Then now we're talking about the two trials which made, I would say, interventions very, very happy. Because we did a lot of trials in the past, and they usually they come up with the neutral results. Positive is rare. One of them was placebo-controlled trial of PCI in a stable ischemic heart disease called Orbiter 2. What was the trial done in UK? And basically was that Dutch PCI without anti-angel medication improve angina compared to placebo. Remember their trials of PCI versus medical therapy, both are equal, little better outcome with the you know excite tolerance with the PCI group. Uh, but many of the patients with the with medical therapy group get the PCI. And what if you take the medicines out, stop all the medicine, do the PCI, and other group, you give all the medicine and follow them. So this was basically the Orbiter 2 trial was. The basically, but they have a symptoms, positive stress test, coronary artery disease. And what they did is that after taking the medicine out, uh, you know, enrolling the patient, teach them, teach the patient, to put their symptoms. No nurse practitioner, no coordinator. Let the patient report their angina symptoms, how good or how bad they are feeling. So patient reported, no question on that. And therefore, after two weeks of washout, patients were randomized, and then they followed the patients for 12 weeks uh, about uh, here. So angina with a daily diary, anti-anginal units, uh, unacceptable, unacceptable angina. So the very fancy trial, very strict trial, all patients, got the angiogram, and the catheters were inserted, even in the uh, medical therapy group. The patient did not know whether they got the stent or not. So that was, they, they did orbit, orbiter one and same orbiter two. It's a sham control. Would you believe that could happen? I don't think it can happen in America. That you'll in, invasive, you do the angiogram, and you still don't put a stent. But that was the trial. That's what these guys did. Majority were single vessel disease, about 300 patients, and what did they find? that clearly the PCI group has a significantly lower angina, 2.9 um, score versus 5.6, mean anti anginal episodes were lower, and then uh, medication use was lower, and more importantly, improved exercise treadmill time, and echocardiographic score was better. So this is the first time showing that PCI alone, 
without medical therapy was better than maximum medical therapy. And at the same time, look at the placebo group. Medical therapy in six weeks, uh, in 12, the six patients develop uh, MI, none in the PCI group after they left the hospital. So it makes sense that PCI does do a good job. And therefore, now you can say two things. Not everybody should be on medical therapy, medical therapy, and then fail and get PCI. No. You can make it a point that we are going to do a PCI and no issue on medical therapy. Or you can start with the initial medical therapy. If it fails, then go to PCI for refractive symptoms. Only problem is cost, resource utilization, capacity, or volume will increase. You know how many patients? There is a rough data that when a physician or cardiologist sees in office 10 patients on medical therapy, one of them, one about 10 to 12 percent, then referred for the invasive testing because they failed medical therapy. But if you think about that, 10 becomes 100. Because everybody want, do you want to send for PCI? We have the data to support that yes, PCI will be better. And so this is a concept. It's still a lot to do, not the guideline. The real trial, I would say, which will made a big difference, big headline was preventive PCI for vulnerable plaque or prevent trial. What does that mean? The patient didn't need PCI because we did FFR and FFR was more than 0.8. So we know that those patients, some of them develop MI. I said, how can that be? Because there is a trial, it's the basis of the trial basic was that October OCT, combined OCT FFR trial was that if you look at those lesions on OCT, and then they have a thin cap fiber atheroma, and those patients have event rate much higher than FFR of less than 0.8, and you put a stent. So just to say that vulnerable plaque has a higher event rate uh, compared to uh, even you put a stent in the FFR of less than 0.8. So there is a concept that maybe this vulnerable plaque should be sealed. Originally, we decided using the absorber stent in this trial, but absorber was taken off, then we put a regular drug eluting stent, or 1600 trial from Korea, uh, BBS and DES versus medical therapy, and they followed the patients, uh, various uh, parameters of the vulnerable plaque uh, was seen, and look at the two-year event rate. These are a very low risk patient. If you put a stent, event rate was 0.4, and 3.4 if you did not put a stent in these cases. By definition, they should be good. The FFR was negative. But look at a 3.4% event in these patients. So it was really the groundbreaking. The first time, the concept of the vulnerable plaque sealing with the stent, BVS or drug looting stent, made sense. And this was the major trial, I, I would say, interventional cardiology. Uh, individual endpoints are shown here. And you say, well, the, look at the, uh, the conclusion uh, in the Lancet. The patient with a non-flow limiting vulnerable plaque, preventive PCI, reduced major adverse event from high-risk vulnerable plaque compared with optimal medical therapy alone. Given that PREVENT trial is the first large randomized trial show the potential benefit of focal treatment of vulnerable plaque, these findings support consideration to expand indication for PCI to include non-flow limiting high-risk vulnerable plaque. You know, if this happens, we have only six cath lab. We probably have to double it. <laughs> How many people with a vulnerable plaque is walking around? As I said, 10 versus 100. So this is coming back to, but we say, just hold on. We don't make our policy change on one case. So now there are three trials that are ongoing to answer the same question. One is the combined intervene trial in the chronic coronary syndrome, experimental PCI, TICFA, more than FFR, more than 0.75, putting a stent. Large number of patients now, uh, trial ongoing with a two-year endpoint. Second is the interclima trial intervention strategy for non-culprit lesion based on the OCT findings. And the lastly is the favor for AMI trial in acute MI. So whether this one, these trials are positive, then you can say now the guidelines should change. Maybe we had to be in particularly high risk patient, we should look at that lesion and then decide the PCI. So these are the 10 and now let me put it together to take home message. One, have they changed my or our clinical interventional practice in 2024? ACMO in cardiogenic shock, two thumbs down. <laughs> IFR versus FFR at five years and IVAS versus OCT, neutral. I mean, could be both. IFR definitely lost in five years. Then, cabbage over FFR guided PCI, BCI, BCIS chip score, PCSK inhibitor uh, with our yellow three in cap thickness, thumbs up. Then, DCV in small vessels and diabetic, imaging guided PCI, Impella in cardiogenic shock, 
two thumbs up. Then drug-coated balloon in ISR, immediate and complete revascularization in ST elevation, immediate, and MI, and elderly patient. So all that, three thumbs up. And those who have been following, I started this thumbs up thing from 1998. <laughs> I have never done, I have never given to any trial four thumbs up. And I can tell you, I take a pride in making first time the four thumbs up to the PCI with no meds versus on me medical therapy or PCI for vulnerable plaque or versus medical therapy, four thumbs up, making it a very positive trial to change our better interventional practice. So clearly made a major, major changes uh, in our interventional cardiology to make us a better operator, improve patient's outcome. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much.